Well, hello, everyone. Are we ready to start? OK, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone, again. Uh, before we start, I would like to say that this conference is being held on the lands of the five tribes of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I would like to pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and Aboriginal elders of the other communities who might be here today. Well. I am so excited to be here. My name is Carolina Umada. I work in harm reduction for the past six years. I work as a, at a harm reduction project in Argentina for people, for young people in nightlife, and I am also deputy di director of Youth Rights, an international uh, youth-led organization. I am thrilled, as I said, to be chairing this session with these amazing panelists and colleagues. I would like to start first uh, by welcoming Ana Cristina Sampaio Malouf. She's a pharmacist with a master's degree in neuroscience, currently working with uh, drug checking uh, in her doctoral project, which uh, she does in collaboration with the incredible NGO EDLA, one of Brazil's uh, oldest harm reduction organizations, where she also works as a volunteer since 2015. Ana Cristina, please. So hi everyone, my name is Ana Cristina. Uh, as Carolina said, I work in an Adelaide drop-in center, uh, specifically in a, on a project called Respiri, that focuses on harm reduction in the context of parties and music festivals. I'm also a PhD student in a pharmacology at the University of Campinas, both in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So I'm very glad to be here in this conference. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity to be here and share with you uh, what's going on in Brazil regarding drug checking as a harm reduction strategy. Uh, so, uh, SPD projects work in an integrated framework uh, where we always offer drug checking uh, service together with information and, hair care and, and, and care spaces. Um, we are one of, one of the oldest group in Brazil working with harm reduction in party context. Uh, the project started in 2011, uh, and only during its first year has founded by the federal government for a program of the Ministry of Health for the prevention of hepatitis. Although, although it was a short time, it was very important to disseminate and raise awareness about harm reduction strategies among event organizers. Before that, no one uh, uh, even knew the term harm reduction. So uh, in 2012, when our funding ended, uh, our only option was to charge event organizers for uh, our service. And that's, the, that's how we finance ourselves until today. After we had the chance to show our work, organizers understood the importance of investing in harm reduction and continue to hire us. Uh, for people who are at this event, of course, our services are free uh, of charge because it will, has already pay, been paid for the, uh, uh, by the organizers. So, that's why we can finance uh, our actions. So uh, in addition to paying for the materials and logistics uh, of the interventions, we also consider it important to remunerate, to, uh, to remunerate the people who work with us. That's it. They do not just uh, work as volunteers. Uh, this way, we manage to maintain a diverse team and avoid elitism. Uh, in the context of brutal social inequality in Brazil, marginalized populations have, uh, have few job opportunities. So have a payment for harm reduction work is a way to empower, this, to empower these people and recognize their knowledge and experience about drug use. In this sense, uh, we see harm reduction not only as a tool for caring for others, but also as a way of caring for caregivers and promoting income generation, autonomy, and empowerment of harm reduction workers uh, who are also people who use drugs. Um, so in these 12 years, we have carried out more than one, 100 interventions in party contexts and managed to, to reach several other contexts beyond electronic music festivals, 
like university parties, LGBT pride parade, carnival, among others, and we have already trained approximately uh, 250 harm reduction workers. So I would like to point out that in Brazil, we have an, an effervescent scene of harm reduction practice and groups that work in the context of Paris. First, because we are a country of uh, continental dimensions and with a great cultural diversity. Second, because we love parties, as you may know. <laughs> uh, so here you can see some of these groups. Uh, basically, we made up, uh, made, basically, they are made up of people who use drugs and want to provide peer support, uh, except from Hespiri, which is part of Adelaide Dropping Center. None of these uh, groups are formally constituted. Uh, they act autonomously and independently. Uh, so, and according, according to a survey con uh, that we conducted in 2019, there were uh, that, that were around 40, uh, 42 groups active in Brazil. Among the 31 who completed the survey on the carried out activities, uh, 30, uh, 23, 23 reported performing drug checking, all of them using colorimetric reagents. Uh, but after the pandemic, uh, we had some change in this scenario. So uh, now we need to do a new mapping to find out how is the current scenario, how, how many are still active, uh, and how many are still doing drug checking. Um, also, in recent years, we have been working hard to consolidate uh, and organize our network, uh, which works as a collaborative platform, information exchange, and political organization uh, to do harm reduction advocacy in Brazil. Uh, we are fighting for a recognition of our work, professionalization of harm reduction work, public funding lines, as well as the drug policy reforms. Uh, we are still working on the development of this website, but um, that we host all content produced by our network, such as our manifesto for harm reduction in events, uh, code of ethics for workers, as well as contact and location of each, of each one of the group of the network members. Uh, we are also planning to use these sites as a place to record and disseminate the analysis results and thus compare trends across different regions of the country. Well, uh, this is my job in this one network, so I'm in charge to develop this part of this site. I have a lot of work to do, but I think it's going to be great. Uh, we are also planning to, to use this site as a place to uh, okay, that's it. Uh, so in the future, you will have the opportunity to see more information about what's going on in Brazil in this on this website. Uh, because currently we there is no record of this data, like the groups uh, do it more do, do not systematize the data. So we want to organize all of this. Uh, so we want to standardize the protocol so that we can systematize the da this data and thus generate reports to inform people who use drugs assisted by our network. Uh, so I could not fail to mention about our partners uh, who provide us free reagents so that we can carry out our drug checking interventions. Uh, these amazing guys uh, have a laboratory where they produce uh, and sell colorimetric reagents all over Brazil. And this was uh, really uh, changed the game regarding drug check in our country, make it more, uh, much more accessible because before we had to purchase these from other countries and so it uh, was very uh, expensive for us. Um, so, here um, we can see some potentialities and difficulties uh, we saw today in Brazil to develop drug checking. Uh, as you saw, uh, we have a lot of harm reduction groups, 
um, but it is still very little considering the vast territory. Uh, great interest in, of the groups in carrying out drug checking interventions. Uh, and national manufacturers of colorimetric reagents that, that lower the cost, delivery time, and greater accessibility to us. But the difficult point is that we still have a very restrictive policy. Uh, it's still, con it still considered a crime to possess drugs, even for personal use. Uh, this puts us in a constant danger of criminal criminalization. Um, I already ended up in a policy station <laughs> uh, to provide explanation about our work, but so that this is, that's a story for another time. I can share with you later if you want. Uh, but after all, uh, I can give you a spoiler that I was not arrested. I'm glad I'm here to talk with you. Uh, so. Other point, uh, very difficult, is about limited fi financial resources. This, this impairs us from assessing confirmatory analysis and methodologies and improving the quality of our data. Uh, difficulty in providing training. Uh, and we also had four years of a very conservative government that removed harm reduction from national policy. Uh, this was another point that difficult our uh, advocacy work. So um, and that brings us to the part of the presentation about uh, the scientific research that we are developing in partnership with the Laboratory of Analytical Toxicology of the University of Campinas that is part of my PhD project. Uh, the main aim of this research is to evaluate the feasibility and impact of inserting a drug checking service as a harm reduction strategy as in, in party context in Brazil. As secondary goals, uh, we can say that it's to develop uh, and test methodologies and ways to organize the service, uh, verify if, if substances uh, people are consuming is in fact what they expect they, they want uh, uh, and, and, and what are what the reactions to an un unexpected result? Uh, prevent inadvertent uh, use of unknown substance. Uh, detect possibly circulating new substances, um, new psychoactive substance. Uh, inform about the risk of each substances and mixtures. Identify patterns of use specific to power context and possible new trends. Evaluate users' previous, uh, users previous experience with test methods and the importance they are attributed to this practice. So about the methodology we use, uh, we, conduct, uh, we conducted data collection in, a, uh, in an integrated service, as I mentioned. That means uh, joint action with harm reduction info stand. That is the informative part of the job and a point of care. We always do uh, in conjunction. Uh, we explain and invite uh, to take part of the research. And in case of uh, acceptance, the person completes the questionnaire, uh, which is self-applied. Then we perform the colorimetric tests. Uh, in some samples, we also perform the thin layer chromatography test. Uh, feedback of the results, counseling, and forwarding to InfoStand. Um, that's it. So uh, here I show the preliminary data collected into two interventions, one before the pandemic and other after the pandemic. One was carried out in a big festival music party lasting seven days, and the other one in a urban electronic party. Uh, so preliminary results shows that the, uh, in intervention one, 12.6% of samples analyzed did not contain the expected substances and 4% contained some kind of mixtures. Uh, in the intervention two, 25% of samples analyzed did not contain the expected substances and 23% contained some kind of mixtures. Uh, 
Analyzing the questionnaire showed that 13% uh, of people gave up using substance after knowing the test result. Uh, another 22% reported that they will use it in uh, less amount. Uh, 76 reported that they plan consumption in advance, always or almost always. Uh, and 71% reported that they follow uh, consumption planning always or almost always. So as a conclusion, we can say that electronic music parties attendees positively engage with harm reduction service when offered. Uh, differences in differences in adulteration profile in samples analyzed before and after the pandemic will also vary. Um, uh, show up. Uh, high rate of adulteration represents a great risk to people who use drugs and show the potential of drug checking service to prevent uh, the inadvertent use of a no substance to, re to reduce amount you ingested and thereby decrease in the risk of intoxication. So the fact that the majority of respondents plan consumption in advance demonstrate that there are a great opportunity to, for interventions. So as next steps, we plan to complete the number of samples, samples connect, collected, uh, evaluate agreement between results obtained in field and in laboratory tests, uh, analyze sociodemographic profile and patterns of use uh, at parties, and see for possible new psychoactive substances in circulation. Uh, so this is a study that we did in collaboration. Uh, here the analysis was made from saliva samples, uh, oral fluid uh, in case, uh, collected in electronic music party participants who were in our harm reduction space. Um, I share uh, it here if you are interested to read it later. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ana Cristina. It was so great to be here also and be able to hear what Brazil has been doing for the past years and also presenting your amazing work in Australia. That's very nice and very excellent as well. So I was so nervous before that I forgot to tell you that we are in Check Your Product, Drug Checking and Drug Alerts. Welcome. <laughs> I was uh, presenting yesterday, and I thought that that was like hard enough, but this is harder, so yeah. OK. So our next panelist is Colin Kelty. Uh, he's a research associate at the Vancouver Island Drug Checking Project located in so-called Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, on the lands of the First Nation Aboriginal. He's a lost astrophysicist, and oh my god, astrophysicist who has found his way into community-based drug checking and harm reduction. Welcome, Colin. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Kelty. I am a research associate with Substance. Uh, today I'll be sharing an overview of uh, the use of paper spray mass spec at our uh, drug checking service. Uh, I am here today from the unceded and traditional uh, and contemporary territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, uh, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations uh, in so-called British Columbia, where I am uh, deeply grateful and extremely privileged to be able to uh, work and live as a settler. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the inextricable link between uh, links, or sorry, links between research, uh, colonialism, uh, racism, and violence against indigenous peoples that continue to this day. Um, ending this violence faced by people who use substances cannot be achieved without facing the legacy uh, through which we have come to be uh, on these stolen territories. Um, I'd really like to uh, support Flaster's comments this morning that when we're looking at public health data, 
Uh, it's easy to draw charts, uh, make lines, provide statistics. Um, however, these data are a collection of people, experiences, memories, truths uh, that should not be stripped from their context. And I ask that we hold our friends and family at heart when we look at data. Um, by this point, I think a lot of us are familiar with what's going on in BC. Uh, seven years ago, the province declared a public health emergency uh, related to the overdose crisis. Uh, seven years later, we're still in this nightmare. Um, it's the essentially highly erratic nature of the opioid supply that has um, essentially propagated this crisis. However, ultimately, it is the failure of drug policy that has allowed it to exist in the first place. Molecules are not the issue. Politicians are. Um, but in that context, we do receive a huge amount of funding from the government as a response. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that privilege that we have in BC to be able to operate these services. Uh, who are we? We're Substance. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary research project based out of University of Victoria's School of Social Work and Departments of Chemistry and Computer Science. It's a free, it's a confidential, it's an anonymous service. Uh, we run every sample through a suite of technologies. Um, and people can get the results in about 20 minutes. Um, I'll keep it short here so we can enjoy the um, joys of mass spec. And I encourage you to find the rest of us here running around um, so you can learn more about our project. Uh, we're supported by a ton of super rad people with a range of backgrounds, so I'm really grateful to call my colleagues. Um, specific to the mass spec, we're supported heavily from Vancouver Island University, um, specifically Chris Gill's group um, and students Armin Sachi, uh, Scott Borden, uh, Taylor Zarkovic, and Lucas Abruzzi, who are really the champions of this instrument. Well, I'll strobe past your partners who keep the creative light bulbs on uh, and the physical lights on at our service. So we operate in a multi-instrument model. We run um, immunoassay strip tests, you know, simple yes or no on whether or not fent or benzos are present. Uh, while helpful in non-opioid samples, the opioid supply is fentanyl and largely benzos, so they have limited resourcefulness when analyzing uh, dope. Uh, we use FTIR as a gold standard to detect primary actives. However, its uh, limit of detection um, is often insufficient to quantify the low concentration actives that are present within the opioid supply, um, really warranting the need for something that is sensitive, quantitative, specific, fast, and easy to interpret, and mass spec checks off these boxes. Uh, rather than amble aimlessly into the analytical chemistry abyss, oh, we're getting caught up here. Um, I'm going to be supported here today by Ali Miskolin, who's a chemistry student uh, on our project. And she's going to run a sample for us in real time. Uh, I'll just talk over to explain what's going on. Uh, so diving right on in, service users will drop off about five megs of sample. Uh, the harm reduction worker does the intake. Uh, they run the strip tests before passing it on to uh, us as technicians. Uh, using an analytical balance, um, she'll weigh out between five, or sorry, half a mig and two migs of sample. Um, you know, the mass spec is destructive, so we try not to request too much sample from people as drugs are expensive, um, and we are able to uh, get away with using quite small amounts. Once the sample is weighed, we uh, drop it into HPLC grade methanol. Uh, this is to dissolve it. We vortex it to heck with our vibrators. Um, and in doing so, we essentially minimize the impact of uh, matrix effects, small scale heterogeneity within the sample. Um, but acknowledging that by only testing a milligram of you know, someone's total batch, that those results are only accurate for that milligram. Uh, drugs like cocaine will dissolve readily, where things like pressed pills um, take a little bit more of a kick to get into solution. From here, uh, Ali's going to spike it down in order, or two orders of magnitude and concentration into a solution that we call our internal standard. Um, the internal standard is a slurry of uh, 17 different reference compounds. These are deuterated standards that we've uh, acquired through like, chemical supply. Uh, the idea here is that they are delivered at a known concentration, and they're known drugs. 
Uh, and by delivering them alongside every sample that we check, we can calibrate the instrument's performance while also um, essentially producing a uh, calibration curve to which we can use to quantify the signal collected and ultimately the amount of drug in the sample. Um, once the sample plus standard in the internal standard vial is well mixed, uh, we deposit 10 microliters onto one of these paper spray plates. Uh, each plate here can hold 12 samples per side, 24 total. Um, the paper itself is just like chromatography paper. It comes to a little point at the end. But these uh, strips uh, give, or the paper gives uh, paper spray mass spec its name. So the idea is a high voltage is applied to the paper, uh, roughly four and a half kilovolts. This causes the solution on the paper to ionize and like literally spray off of the tip of the paper, where the instrument has an inlet that pulls in the ion beam. Um, these plates cost about 120 Canadian each, so that's like five dollars per sample in the plates alone. Uh, if you add in the other disposables of um, like gloves, pipette tips, methanol, the building rent, the cost to run the instrument, staffing costs, uh, it costs about hundred dollars Canadian per sample to run the mass spec. Uh, obviously, this bill is picked up by our funders, and the service remains free to our service users. Uh, while Ali does some bookkeeping here, I'll dive into the methodology a bit. Um, the idea is we use something that we call the targeted analysis or targeted method. Uh, within it, we scan for 105 different compounds in every sample. Uh, these are commonly uh, used drugs, those found within the unregulated supply. There's a huge list of uh, opioids, benzos, psychedelics, uh, common cuts for cocaine, cocaine, uh, and the whole list can be found here. Uh, within each, uh, or within the method, there's a quantitative uh, model for each compound. Um, calibration curves are produced from analytical standards, and we're able to quantify drugs in these samples between about half, a per, or half of a tenth of a percent to 80% uh, by weight, and our limit of detection is much lower. Uh, having this sensitivity is super helpful for our service users who uh, use opioids as the <coughs> opioid supply is a very low concentration uh, market given the strength of um, uh, fentanyl and its analogs. Uh, I'll spare you the details of what's actually happening inside the instrument itself. I'm not an analytical chemist, I'm not a mass spec person, uh, but essentially magnets, uh, the quadruples weigh um, the molecules by their mass and their charge, and they count how many reach the detector at the end. Uh, using paper spray in tandem with a triple quad mass spec, um, we're able to do this fast service. Uh, away the sample goes into the instrument. Thank you, Ali. And uh, Matilda, which is the loving name for this little unicorn that we have on top of the instrument, will take it from here. All right, uh, while Matilda is counting ions, uh, I thought I'd talk about some of uh, the work we do with the results. So back in early 2022, we were checking a lot of opioid samples where the benzo strip was positive, but we weren't coming up with any benzos on our mass spec or on our other instruments. That's this, uh, I wonder if we can see the cursor, we can't, the darker uh, dotted line. Uh, through untargeted analysis, uh, discussion with our service users, uh, our collaborators across Canada, um, we were able to identify bromazolam, a novel benzo, within the opioid supply. Uh, we acquired the standard, we added it to the method, and you know, in May we started checking all samples for bromazolam. Sure enough, it showed up. It's the dark purple line there that's creeping up to the uh, right. Uh, we see bromazolam in 30% of down samples these days. And is comparable to uh, alprazolam or Xanax in both strength and duration. Uh, in another study led by uh, Scott Borden and Armin Sachi at VIU, uh, they detected some novel carfent structural analogs in opioids. Um, they did some modeling with like binder uh, or binding affinities to suggest that these uh, analogs and precursors may be as potent as carfentanil itself, uh, meaning like the combined strength of all of these compounds present in illicitly produced carfentanil um, you know, can have the really potent effect that carfentanil is known to have. Uh, I've trimmed out the last step of the process as Matilda is finishing up here, um, which is literally just clicking a button to upload the like, data that the mass spec or collects to our uh, database. Um, but the software essentially automatically uh, 
um, restricts the results to those that are present above our limit of reporting. Um, and then we tailor a, resort, or a report for the service user. Um, that's really the whole process, though, start to finish. Uh, we run between 30 to 50 samples per shift based on our current staffing and workflow. Um, but it's really this throughput that allows us to um, operate mass spec in a point of care setting. Uh, while the mass spec is fun to play with, uh, it actually provides some information that may be useful to some. I encourage you to check out this paper that Bruce and friends put together on the socio-ecological model of drug checking. They ran some interviews with people who use drugs, people who sell drugs, and the people who support them. Uh, and the participants described the impact and benefits of drug checking outside of the kind of standard commentary on informing consumption. Um, I'll focus on a particular subset of this model, which is the relationship that we have with suppliers and like quality testing. Uh, our relationship with groups like Dolph and Solid have improved our heroin quant. They essentially told us we were wrong. We were getting the wrong quantification. We were, and we wouldn't have known that without them. Uh, this particular service user was just doing some batch testing for some fentanyl that they were preparing. We can see in the analyst notes that their sample ranged between 5 and 8%, uh, depending on which chunk we were testing. Uh, mass spec supports our commentary on not a bad batch, meaning that the dangers of the, uh, the dangers of the unregulated supply are not necessarily due to any one bad sample, but this kind of volatile nature that exists over time. So the, what we're seeing here is the fentanyl concentration in down quantified over 2022. The solid line is the median fentanyl concentration. The kind of shaded region is where 50% of our samples fall. And we can see that it's just this wild range every month. You know, flip a coin, and it's either going to be 5% fent, 20% fent, or somewhere in between. And similarly, we can look at stats for a bunch of low concentration drugs that we've quantified within the supply. And we see that the median concentration for a lot of these drugs is actually below the limit of detection for FTIR, uh, really furthering the need for like, low concentration quantitative results when we're looking at a polysubstance synthetic opioid supply. Uh, finally, I'd finish with some art here. Um, we're looking at roughly 3,200 opioid samples uh, that have been checked at our service site. Each dot is a sample. The color of the dot is the actual color of the sample itself. They're all like you know, powders or whatever. Um, and then the size of the point is proportional to the fentanyl concentration that we've quantified. Um, you know, when I see these data, I see the erratic nature of the supply, but I also see all of the people who came in uh, to access our service with these samples. Um, this is our community and all of its chaotic, vibrant beauty. Uh, I see the warmth and pleasure and vibrance of our community and our support for one another. Um, I see our curiosity to uh, try to better understand this wacky world that we're forced to live in and our determination to improve our collective wellness. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Colin. That was amazing. Basically, it's like my dream come true since back home we only work with <laughs> color regions. And I think the most important thing and the most fantastic here is that um, to see how a, a university engaged uh, with sophistic sophisticated drug checking and also that it's led by their students. So thank you for that. Um, so our next panelist is uh, Rowan Henry. Uh, she's CEO, Directions Health Services. She has an extensive experience working in collaboration to deliver innovative programs that better meet the needs of the community and disadvantaged populations in mental health and uh, drug and alcohol sectors. Rowan is a uh, AICD graduate, graduate sorry, and director on ATODA and CA. HMA uh, boards. Sorry about that. Uh, Browin is, um, yeah, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. It's great to see so many people interested in this topic. Um, Steph and my name, I'm Bronwyn obviously, and Steph and my name are both um, on the presentation, but given the quick time frame, we decided that I'll whiz through the presentation and Steph will be available for questions after, and there's some other people in the audience who you might like to talk to as well. Um, 
Hopefully I'll go. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today, which was never ceded, the Boonwurrung Boon Wurrung and the Wurrungjeri Woi Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation, and apologies for my pronunciation, um, and pay my, our respects to their elders past and present, and just reaffirm that Directions is committed to actions that promote reconciliation and a better future for all First Nation peoples, including let's all get behind the voice. Um, we also value diversity in our community and I'd like to acknowledge some of the amazing people in the room today and at this conference. Um, Steph Stevens, of course, who has been living and breathing Canter since we first started establishing it. Chris Goffin and uh, Steph Chinitas from Karma, who... Um, um, have been amazing in terms of the peer and community support. Mal McLeod, who's our guru and does all the sexy stuff in terms of the um, <laughs> chemical analysis. Um, Gino Vumbocca and David Caldicott from PDA, and David is our um, clinical lead and toxicologist. Um, Ella Dukes Frain from ACT Health. Anna Olsen and Amy Peacock, uh, who are the members of the evaluation team who are here, and all the CanTest staff, and they're all amazing, and there's a bunch of them sitting over there just near the front on the left-hand side. So all these people are sitting pretty much towards the front. If you want to grab them after the um, session, I'm sure they'd be really happy to talk to you. Um, we operate what what's termed a front of house drug checking and health service, first fixed site in Australia. Um, the focus obviously on public health and harm reduction. We test samples brought in by the public and give those results directly back to the people who brought the sample in. Um, we also offer individualised harm minimisation and um, health interventions, and it's a model that was adapted to the local ACT conditions. Um, the consortium is Directions Health Services. We've got the contract with ACT Health and uh, the service lead. We've got a subcontract with Karma for peer educators and to um, for their community expertise, and Pill Testing Australia for their technical expertise. And there were a lot of things that conspired really to help us set up CanTest in the ACT. Um, the successful trials that PTA ran at the Groove and the Moo festivals, which were evaluated by ANU, the strong advocacy over many years by consortium members and strong Canberra community support for drug checking, um, the ANU School of Medicine and Psychology, who've conducted, who conducting the independent evaluation and the previous evaluation conducted by um, ANU, um, the ACT Government Analytic Laboratory, which has been doing quality assurance testing. Um, the ANU School of um, Chemistry, which has been oversighting the testing process. Um, and the really important um, contribution by peer workers um, in, in the design and the delivery of the service. And the other thing that's really exciting, which you might have heard at the welcoming ceremony, is the um, decriminalisation bill that has now passed in the ACT and comes into effect in October. Um, CANTES really is a very multidisciplinary team. The staff um, consist on every shift of chemical analysts, AOD counsellors, peer educators, a registered nurse, an on-call GP, and we also have an on-call manager, with a technical oversight provided on an as-needed basis. Um, we're currently only open three hours um, twice a week, which I know is a very limited window of time for people. 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., which we hoped um, might attract NSP um, clients who are coming to our NSP service, which is very close by, and on Friday night, 6 to 9 p.m. Um, we do do extended hours prior to festivals, such as when we had spilt milk and Groove in the Moo coming up. Um, when people come in, obviously they're welcome to the service, and we've tried to create a really um, welcoming atmosphere. Um, they're asked to put their phone in a locker, and they keep the key to that, and surprisingly few people actually push back on that. Um, they're asked to sign a waiver that explains the li limitations of the service if they're having um, drug checking conducted. They could just be coming for health service or just to check out what the service is like for future reference. 
um, service data is collected in terms of our KPIs on the contract, plus there's a pretty extensive pre-test survey um, which contributes to the evaluation. The testing happens, the results are given, um, harm reduction interventions are offered, not everybody accepts them, but the majority do, and then there's a post-test survey. And there's also an opportunity to contribute um, subsequently either by survey or um, by interview. Well, that's the testing room and the equipment. We're in a tiny little space, but we've managed to cram in quite a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail on the testing process. One, I am so not a chemist. And two, we do not have time. So, um, But these slides will be available anyway. Um, so this is just a little summary that's been prepared of the FTIR fentanyl test trips and the UPLC testing that's conducted. Um, yeah, you, happy, happy for you to have a copy of the slides or chat to Mal afterwards. Um, the harm reduction and health interventions um, include um, risk factors and how to mitigate those around the drug itself, around the individual and their circumstances, and around the setting in which they use. And obviously that's a very broad range of services, or it may be just health interventions. It could be wound care, it could be you know any number of things, advice about steroid injection. There's a whole range of health interventions, mental health, um, so that's just the um, quality testing by ATGAL, which in the pilot, every sample was quality tested and the concordance with results was really high. Um, and then selected samples were taken back to ANU and tested and that resulted in identifying some unknown but, but quite what we thought were dangerous um, substances. Um, concerning substances, uh, we, the service can put out a community notification that's yellow if it's of concern but, but not super bad, um, or red, which we think could have some significant adverse events for people. Um, these are discussed fortnightly or in the case of red um, alerts or red notifications within 24 hours. With ACT Health, with the technical and the clinical and management experts at um, CanTest and the New South Wales Poisons Information Centre pro provide sort of additional toxicology input. Um, and decisions on whether or not a public alert and what type of alert would be issued are based on potential for harm, level of urgency and the target audience. And that could be the general public, it could be the emergency service providers, it could be people who inject drugs, you know, it, it's just, really targeted to the right audience. Um, and ACT Health may choose to issue a public alert. Um, we do a monthly summary um, and that's publicly released so you can have a look at that and that has the main findings of each month and the activity at the um, that's occurred over that month. Um, that's just a list of the common fillers that um, we've found. And I'm sure you'd all be familiar with um, most of those. Um, in terms of what is li more likely to be expected when people bring the substance in, um, heroin and methamphetamine reliably turn out to be that. Um, least reliable is ketamine by quite a long way, I think, um, but also MDMA and cocaine in terms of purity and um, adulteration. That's the service data for the six month pilot. Um, so just under five people attended for that time, 675 um, drug and alcohol interventions and 85 health interventions were given um, and 614 samples tested. And you'll see that every single sample gets an FTIR test. Um, f about two thirds had UPLC conducted and that's offered to everyone who comes in. And 131 um, fentanyl tests were conducted. And Thankfully for Australia so far and for the ACT, we haven't detected any fentanyl, although it's been a small number of samples of um, heroin that's been tested. Um, the interim evaluation report, which was three months in, um, showed that really it's got a very high um, 
service users satisfaction rating. Um, the majority of service users accepted a drug and alcohol or general health intervention. And 62% had never spoken about their drug use to a healthcare worker before. And some of the other interesting things are, in terms of there's a very broad age, age range. Um, less than 25 years was the largest, but not by much. So you can see it's quite evenly spread. Um, two thirds are male, 18% of drugs were dis guarded in the first three months, but that's um, since reduced in the subsequent three months. Um, where the results were not expected, 61% said they would definitely not use the drug, 91% said they'd tell others about it, and some of the examples of the harm uh, reduction behaviours were that 51% said they'd use a test dose or space out their use, and 46% said they'll make sure someone else is with them. Um, these are some of the, um, just a little summary of future developments. The, the pilot got extended to August 2023, which is looming, um, but the independent evaluation conducted by Anna and Co is um, due for release before that date. Um, there's new analytical methods um, as we speak, and um, a new testing protocol for LSD and NBOM is um, just about to happen this week at CanTest. Um, and the hours of service will be reviewed in response to what the patrons have said in the evaluation, and obviously depending how much funding is available. Um, some of the enablers and the successes, you know, we can't really go past the ACT government's health first approach to harm reduction, um, and also the whole of government support, including the police. I think the multi-agency consortium, it's got such a broad skill mix, it's fantastic. The goodwill of all the partners to make this work and the extensive in-kind support provided, um, the strong ACT community um, support and also so really positive media, both locally and nationally. Um, and, and the fact that the harm reduction info has been communicated really widely in the Australian community. Um, some of the lessons learned with a really complex model that we've got, obviously that has fantastic benefits, but it also is quite resource intensive. Um, we've had quite a significant increase in demand for steroid and P, other P testing, which is interesting. So we're just looking at how we can better um, test some of those products. Um, we've had occasion when people have come in um, for testing of illicit gender affirming treatment drugs. Um, people who inject drugs, we're really hoping to encourage to come in more. They're only around 10% of service users at the moment. And I think, generally speaking, take that population group takes a little bit of time to trust services. Their experience of services hasn't been that great in the past. Um, but also, the, the fact that the things they're generally injecting are quite often most reliable in our supply, probably means there's a little, little less motivation to come in. Um, and I think the fixed site, we've demonstrated we can have really quite sophisticated testing and fantastic results back to the patrons and to the wider community, but you can't have the throughput that you need for festivals and events. And we really need testing at festivals, but we all know some of the stumbling blocks <laughs> around that, including insurance, unfortunately. Um, and that's it. I'd just really like to acknowledge um, Karma and PTA as our partners and ACT Health and the ANU. Um, and um, yeah, thank you all for listening. <laughs>
Thanks so much, Carolina. Um, so first, a massive shout out to what's going on at Canberra and the fact that we actually have fixed site drug checking in Australia. I think that's really incredible. Um, <laughs> That being said, unfortunately here in the state of Victoria, uh, there is no government support or appetite for drug checking services. So although we're in a drug checking session, this project wasn't actually linked to any drug checking operations at all. Um, but our findings are obviously relevant to drug checking, but any other drug monitoring system or early warning system that issues alerts. So it was a collaboration between a cast of superstars that you can see on that slide there who worked across research, government, health um, and alcohol and drug treatment, peer education and harm reduction services. And hopefully, yay! Um, and before I start, these beautiful white managum trees are located on the unceded Wurundjeri Willem country where I resided and worked at the time that I was working on this project. Um, I just want to recognise the deep, unique connection to land, waterways, community, cultures, traditions and spirit that the traditional custodians of the lands we now call Australia um, have connections to um, and pay my personal respect to community elders, all First Nations people here and overseas and anyone experiencing systemic racism, marginalisation or stigmatisation. So a little bit of local context of where we're at in the lead up to sort of getting this project off the ground. Um, I'm going to take you all back, some of you very familiarly to 2016, 2017, where five young men died over a six month period, um, quite traumatically actually, after mistakenly consuming a very toxic and quite unusual combination of 25C NBOM and 4FA, in most cases mistaken for MDMA. Um, and very shortly thereafter, in early 2017, the same combination was linked with a large cluster of hospital presentations in a single weekend over a, at a nightclub district in Melbourne, um, which were reported in the media as suspected MDMA overdoses. And at that time, local surveillance systems didn't really exist to rapidly confirm the cause of their spate of deaths and or hospitalisations or warn people about the potential for adulterated supplies um, before more harm happened. However, a leaked internal police memo uh, very shortly thereafter implied that there actually had been prior knowledge of MDMA adulterated with this particular combination. Um, yet there wasn't a formal system existing for public warning systems or alerts. Um, and then we started seeing the same combination popping up again and again and again in other jurisdictions and as frequently, as recently as a couple of months ago at, at World Pride. However, it wasn't until 2020 that the coroner's inquest was um, held and 2021 when the Victorian coroner could confirm those deaths were unintentional uh, consumption of the novel psychoactives. Um, and that's when we started seeing her, uh, the coroner's first recommendations for urgent implementation of drug checking and early detection networks. So there was this climate of um, new harms were escalating locally uh, and in neighbouring states, but we didn't really have... Um, any precedents for timely and wide-scale reporting and monitoring locally or what makes an effective public warning or alert system. So we are basically catching up here, which is when we were lucky enough to get funding, a little bit of seed funding for this little project um, that happened to coincide with around the same time that the Victorian Department of Health were issuing their first public health alerts um, that to this day are not informed by drug checking, but do utilise data from the Emerging Drugs Network of Australia, Victoria branch, uh, which looks at toxicology, clinical information and patient reports during drug-related hospital presentations presentations, and that data is reviewed uh, to help identify potential um, or unexpected changes in the unregulated drug supply. And that's the EdNav project there. Um, sorry, I'm just going to... My font's way too big, so I can't see my notes. There we go. So... Our quite timely research was really lucky, but it was the first phase of what we intended to be a much bigger study. I am going to talk fast for a minute uh, for the eventual translation of data from available um, surveillance systems into timely alerts specific for health and community service workers. So we knew from previous work that a really key challenge for people working in the alcohol and drug sector especially is access to timely and reliable information about novel substances and emerging trends. Um, so we wanted to explore whether alerts about 
about those emerging market trends and the unregulated drug supply would be useful for supporting services and workers to better anticipate, prevent and respond to emerging drug harms. Um, so today I'm only speaking to part A, which is the co-design, and that's the barriers and, you know, things that uh, were impacting the implementation sort of in the context of this emerging early warning system in Victoria. Uh, we used a collaborative, iterative, mixed, me mixed methods approach to co-produce drug alerts with workers who were working in the AOD and um, emergency medicine setting. We sought feedback um, and did a lot of interim analysis to come up with a bunch of prototypes, um, and we sought a lot of feedback throughout that process. Um, we also did a little bit of a retrospective... Um, blah, 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 blah. What did we do? We did a <laughs> we did this uh, like sort of pre-implementation uh, evaluation to sort of identify what factors were going to um, uh, impact implementation. Um, but I'm going to point you towards this paper to read more on our methodology and evaluating framework and our very 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 detailed findings. Which don't worry, I'm not going to go through that whole image up there or expect you to read it. Um, but in summary, workers definitely it's probably no surprise. Uh, we're definitely uh, felt alerts were useful for improving access to evidence-based emerging drug market info. They help facilitate information exchange within and across their community and health networks and settings to promote harm reduction messaging and also to support best practice responses um, in the community and in a clinical setting. But health and community service workers span a very vast range of roles across a ton of different organisations and um, programs and they represent and work alongside very diverse communities of people who use drugs. Um, so the information needs, the guidance they wanted for best practice, their engagement with the alert itself and resulting action varied a lot depending on the worker's perceived kind of identity of their role. Um, so for AOD workers, sharing information, providing harm reduction advice and education was really central to their professional practice. And for emergency medicine providers, they were still into reducing harm, but their context and definition of that was a little bit more aligned with maximising patient safety and improving improving clinical responses. And this is where we sort of started to unravel some really um, crucial design considerations that, as my colleague Isabel, who might be here, uh, put it really beautifully. Otherwise, they would have been footnotes in our design process, and they actually ended up being one of the most important things. So the first is, no matter who your audience is, um, Individuals will have different knowledge, different expertise, different priorities, and it's really important not to make assumptions about their knowledge, their experiences, or how they might interpret alert information or what they want to get out of it. Um, so we had to come up with an alert system that included all of this detailed information and try and cram it into a very detailed alert, um, but trying to get clear and concise design um, to sort of avoid the impact of information overload because alert fatigue and information overload is a very real thing, especially for healthcare and community service workers. So we were challenged here with ensuring that information is accessible, easily recognisable, it's available as soon as it becomes available. But we didn't want to bombard people with too much superfluous information, sort of creating disengagement from the whole alert system, theoretical alert system at the time. Um, so the decision to produce an alert has to be really strategic. Um, and I, I liked that um, Bromwood sort of nodded to that a little bit earlier. And it's equally important not to gatekeep information from people who want to or need access to it. Um, and of course, in a world where people who use drugs are constantly criminalised, stigmatised, um, sensationalised rhetoric that all drugs are bad and all drugs are harmful only builds scepticism in these kind of alert systems. Um, so information that's dated, too generic, unrelatable, irrelevant, will only damage trust and credibility in that system. Um, so here it was important to be transparent about the sort, well, important to our participants, to be transparent about the source of the information using the right message, framing and tone. And of course, when you're trying to achieve whatever your intended consequences or effects are, you've got to try and avoid unintended consequences. Um, but it's impossible to control for all the potential effects, given that um, the desired effects and outcomes will vary across your different audience groups. 
and probably most importantly, and something that sort of weird, it isn't just a side note, even though it's the last tension, although the scope of our project was designing drug alerts for health and community service workers, alerts are ultimately intended to improve the wellbeing of people who use drugs, and we've got to keep them um, at the forefront of all discussions um, in, in you know, development, planning, dissemination, and evaluation for any work that involves them. Um, so we are, and that's obviously the next step of something like this, and we are closely following the work of our colleagues at NDARC who are exploring community preferences and responses to drug alerts as we speak. And of course, we did have peer networks and harm reduction workers and people with lived experience who um, are on, on the team. So, while we know we can't be everything to everybody, um, paying attention to those tensions we've just gone through very quickly. Have a look at the paper if you want to read more. Um, so that we can understand the nuance of how people might engage with the information that's coming out to them in practice to preemptively consider what we can do to make it a little bit more easy for them. Really importantly, time poor alcohol and drug, or anyone, or our workers, were not interested in repurposing alerts for other audiences because they were worried about maybe diluting information, misinterpreting advice, getting it wrong, they didn't have time. So it became really clear to us that the alert system is actually, if it is an actual early warning system, is responsible for creating low barriers methods for accessing different levels of information. Um, so we created multiple levels of alerts to try and get key messages across in a concise way via a text message or a summary flyer, but also have access to that detailed level of information. And we sort of workshop this kind of traffic light system to provide a shorthand for expressing the urgency relevance to try and get around that sort of alert fatigue issue. Um, but with lots of different alerts out there in the world, we had to create a system where no matter where somebody got notified of an alert or came across the information, that they could then equal, easily access that information immediately without having to go and you know find a website and blah, 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 blah. So we did that. I'm going to skip it over. I think I've implied what the implications are. There's a lot of them there, but the moral of the story, we can't downplay competing priorities or the importance of the local, the context and the setting. So that's the sociopolitical context, the target audience, the substances, the substance use setting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They have to be at the centre of your design and implementation of any public health program, really, uh, to maximise credibility, engagement and you know resulting action with the information that you've got. So, with very little time to go, and sorry for talking really fast at you, we'll just quickly come back to Victoria and the current state of play. Department of Health Victoria has successfully um, issued several alerts since their first one in 20, late 2020, um, based on the hospital data from the EdNav network, I think almost entirely. Um, which is there again, if anyone's interested in reading more. and. Um, Peer organisations like Harm Reduction Victoria are doing an incredible work of collaborating with the government to repurpose these alerts and get them out there into the community and assess their reach. And you can very much see the difference in messaging design tone there, right, with a different intended audience. Um, and we know peer delivery mechanisms are critical. They're practical, they're efficient for reaching people who are not actually engaged with health or community services. Um, and this could even help resolve some concerns about the credibility of the alert system and if it's just, you know, mm, drugs are bad, huh? Um, so yeah, it's not really news to anyone in this room that resources for harm reduction services are traditionally overshadowed by prioritising funding for punitive law enforcement um, and reactive rather than proactive responses and resource allocation. A lot of people are doing, as again, as Bronwyn pointed out, actually everybody here pointed out, love jobs and a lot of in-kind work to get this sort of stuff off the ground and over the line. It takes a lot of effort to trawl through data, decide what's important to publish it and then track it and see how it's going and who's engaging with it. So while EdNav has set this amazing template for a really successful multidisciplinary advisory reporting network, um, and hospital settings are really useful for monitoring of substances that have already caused harm, it's not the entire picture and sometimes it's after the horse has bolted. So we've argued that there's huge potential in Victoria to build partnerships with other networks and utilise multiple surveillance um, input data inputs to expedite better, more widespread reporting of emerging threats in our unregulated drug supply. I want a better word than threat, emerging unexpected events. Um, but confirmation of market adulteration is um, almost impossible if you don't have samples to test or you don't know what people thought they were in the first place. So there's a giant gap there, and that gap is drug checking. Um, so while there is no active plan in Victoria for implementing a drug checking service, um, you know, the obvious gap, a low barrier method for maybe 
getting that off the ground could be introducing a form of drug tracking through leveraging off the existing EDNAV network where people are presenting to hospital can surrender, you know, obviously with indemnity, um, samples on their person for analytical testing. And we know that that's been done elsewhere in Canberra with the Actinos project and we know how that worked out in the end, hey? <laughs> um, so there's an opportunity there. But systems like this have to be adequately resourced with the right technology, the right funding, the right staff to do the research and to do the work. So we've got a lot of work to do and I'm very sorry for going over time. Thank you, Rita. Wow, that was amazing. Um, every time I also think of myself about how to design uh, like an approachable and effective drug alert for people who use drugs, that's something that I sometimes, I don't know exactly how to do it. And it's crazy because we work so much in like testing uh, drugs and everything and, and also we have to work a lot to see, okay, how are we going to communicate that and what you just present, it was amazing. So uh, we have uh, 23 minutes, basically, for questions. So Stephanie, if you want to take my, my place. And yeah, so now uh, the floor is yours for questions. Um, I have a question about uh, okay. Andre, I think someone behind you. Okay. Raise your hand first. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Uh, this question's for Rita. I think you may have briefly touched on it, but I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more where the data for your alerts comes from, because I think you said you don't have drug tracking. Are these toxicology or police seizures it's or what? Yeah, it's a really good question. So this particular project we didn't, we haven't yet got off the ground to sort of do what we were hoping to do in that second part by implementing. But the EDNAV, the Victorian government, are pulling data out of this EDNAV project, which is, I think, there's people in the room who could speak to it a lot better than I can, but um, it's toxicology, but it's also clinical information, patient reports, and any information that can be pulled together that gets then assessed by a multidisciplinary team. And then if they see any, like, concerning signal of concern or patterns, then they'll send that sort of up the, I don't know, advisory committee scale, and they will then decide if there's an, a need to issue an alert. So it's just this really small pool of what's really out there, yeah? But it is a really great indicator that harms are happening. So in the case of, you know, the 25C NBOM, if people had have known that that was there, maybe some people would have chosen, you know, a safer... A, I don't want to say safe after the last session was in, a less harmful route of administration. If they had have known they had that combination, they might not have snorted it, and some of them might not be dead. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I've got my high horse again. <laughs> um, more questions? Sorry about that. Um, uh, I'm curious, given what has happened in uh, New Zealand and uh, the, the authorization of like a, a national drug checking uh, consideration, and, and uh, this doesn't go to anyone specific, but I'm, I'm curious if having like a, a national system versus private organizations doing the drug checking, uh, is, is a system preferred over the other? Is there a, a, a preference that would exist within that? And I'm just curious about that. That would be amazing. The way Australia works tends to be state by state and working with the state legislation, but certainly it would be great to see a kind of Commonwealth endorsement or approach across Australia. And certainly the likes of PTA are supporting other jurisdictions to implement pill testing and give it a go. Certainly for Canberra, um, ACT Health's work with the police and that inter-government agreement that was reached really meant that for us as service providers and our partners, we didn't have to grapple with the barriers that initially existed with the initial, I suppose, festival-based pilots. Um, but yeah, that would be amazing. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Anna, I'm just wondering in Brazil, you raised the issue of you, you don't get any government funding. So I'm wondering where you get your funding from and also any of the tests you've done to evaluate the results of the reagent testing uh, and how that's looking in terms of accuracy. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, we had uh, federal uh, funding just for the first year, but at that time we don't even do 
drug checking. We started in 2016. So that founding didn't went to drug checking service. Uh, nowadays, we, we can raise funds like charging uh, event organizers. We charge from them, and that's where we take the money to, to pay for everything. So, and that's it. And now, uh, with the partnership with the university, we, we were able to uh, take like a, a thin layer chromatography. It's from the lab, and then the confirmatory test results we are going to do it uh, in the uh, university lab. So, we did not start, start that part. That's the second part. I, I hope to bring the results. Maybe in the next conference. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, just for um, Stephanie or Bronwyn, um, there was a statistic there about um, the percentage who would not use a drug if it was not expected, which is obviously higher than, than the total who wouldn't use. In my previous studies with drug checking data, I've done an, an, another analysis where you look only at people who not only got what was unexpected, but what they got was something that was new or novel or particularly dangerous. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if someone expects ketamine but gets MDMA, yeah, I mean, you know, they're probably still going to use it, but they're, they're going to use it more safely because they know what it is. Mm -hmm. So really, you can probably even get a higher percentage if you do it that way. Maybe you already have. I just thought I'd ask. We haven't done that deep dive, um, and certainly the evaluation's underway at the moment, and then we're hoping to use and look at that data in lots of interesting ways. Um, but certainly a lot of the drugs that were discarded because they weren't what was expected, it was because of a substitution. So particularly a cathinone or a fentanyl derivative, a lot of which very little is known about. Yeah, so still very relevant to that. And then a high... You know, a relatively high discard rate. The discard rate fluctuates really heavily month on month. So, you know, we all took a deep breath when the three-month interim evaluation report came out and it was a really high discard rate and we knew that the, that very month's results was like an 8% discard rate. <laughs> so it was like, um, but certainly we asked questions around what other behaviour change there is, which Bronwyn touched on. So using less, using a test dose, pacing out their doses or using so with friends. It's not just about do not use. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And not having the pressure, too, of the intervention either side. Lots of people in the conference have been talking about you go into a needle and syringe program and to have to have counselling to get a fit is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we try to be responsive to the person presenting at the service and make sure if they want to get in and out really quickly, they still can as well. But a lot of people love engaging with us and having a chat. Yeah. There'll be a lot more uh, detailed information on those sorts of things in the final report, I think. So watch this space, I think. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Hello. Hi, uh, Leon here from South East Sydney. Um, we're encountering a lot more of these novel psychoactive substances coming in for people who are withdrawing from them, using them over a long period of time, like a tizzalam seems to be coming through the office a lot more. Um, and there's sort of a paucity of information about what to do and how these act differently to other benzodiazepines, for example. I was just wondering if uh, anyone on the panel has any thoughts on whether there's sort of uh, the capacity for sort of aftermarket research, I guess, on, on, on these illicit substances. Is there any way for people to feed back after they've taken, as opposed to would they not take it before they actually consume it, afterwards would they say, I wouldn't take that again, or is there any channels for feedback like mm -hmm. that? Absolutely. That, yeah. it is, that is um, included in one of the questions, like have you had experience with that substance before? So we are collecting that information. But obviously that's only the proportion of people who've tried that substance prior to it being tested. And I think that's the wisdom of our community and peer and living experience networks as well, is that mm -hmm. So often for the, the people coming through CanTest, they want to participate in providing data and having a conversation, not just for them, but there's this altruism around appreciating we're in a pilot stage and we really want this to be here for our friends and family too. So 
when there has been something noteworthy, we have had people come back and tell us, particularly around the 2-fluoro-2-oxo-PCE or the CAN kit, um, and people who um, then had tried that or had it tested after the fact and then could describe that experience to us. And without that, we really wouldn't have known whether we could collect that data a little bit more sophisticatedly to check it and use it probably, but it is happening kind of organically for us. Do you have a follow-up or an opportunity for an opportunity to follow-up? Or is that just the dream and it's we really hard to coordinate? The dream. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm saying yes initially because we have a follow-up in the evaluation of the survey and the um, and this is the wonderful Anna and her team um, and an interview where they could people can say what actually they did do after the fact. So in the weeks Amazing. after coming in to CanTest, they might have said, you know, oh, a 6 out of 10, I'm still going to use the drug compared mm -hmm. to 8 out of 10 before testing. But in the weeks yeah. afterwards, to get that um, honest kind of follow-up, what happened in real life perspective, yeah. um, the evaluation team in their wisdom have included that. Yeah, and also maybe saying that it's very different for, I mean, to ask uh, a person who is going, who is about to check their product on a festival that if he, if he or she or they is going to a lab or another facilitation to do that, it's very different. So, for example, in the field, when I am in a party trying to people to answer a couple of questions, it's really hard mm -hmm. <laughs> because they are very anxious. I, I mean, come on, hurry up, man. I want to take it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's quite hard in that field. But, yeah, in the lab, I, I, I assume that it's very different and you can and take a lot more of information from them. I think that's a really important reflection. The, um, the service was designed off the wisdom of the trials in the mm -hmm. festivals, but it is a really different setting. Like People are planning ahead for their use. Mm -hmm. They might be looking to get on right after the results, but potentially they're coming in months in advance, which um, just the other week was the case for someone. They were testing something they wanted to use in July. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> uh, just just so to complement that, uh, yes. um, so we, we make uh, the drug checking locally and then we also apply a questionnaire that sometimes it's difficult like because of the time. But something we, we, we learned is that when you have a table and a place to sit, people do the questionnaire. If you yeah. make it a more like fast food way, <laughs> people won't want want okay. wait too 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 long to fill the questionnaire. So when we change it the the place, like the physical structure, uh, things change a lot. And also we saw many many people that uh, already took that substance. But anyway, come there to check. Mm -hmm. But uh, but we saw that it was more uh, um, a matter of assess assess. Like people don't even know that we were that we would be there in the party or use that substance in another party that did not had drug checking. And anyway, uh, goes there and ah, I want to check. I I already took it, but I want to know mm -hmm. what is it. So we have it's very common in in our in our work. Okay, uh, I'll try. I'll try that, that advice. Please come sit. We have a yes. conversation. Free massages if you do this interview. Oh, yeah, <laughs> maybe. It really works. <laughs> yeah, we have another question there. Um, my name is Dan from the Netherlands, uh, from Drug Checking Services in the Netherlands. And um, I have a question about drug alerts. Uh, we have in our country a very elaborated system of drug alerts, when or not to issue an alert, and when you do it nationwide or in a specific population. Uh, I was wondering, uh, anyone at the table, how do you and when do you decide to have a full-blown uh, red alert or you decide not to do that? For instance, in the Netherlands, we have done that, a full-blown national, nationwide uh, red alert, as we call it, only in our 30 years of existence, maybe only seven or eight times. So it, we do it very limited for the reason that was mentioned by you. Um, but I was just wondering how you do that in your countries. Thank you. Probably feels familiar. Yeah. Um, I can talk to the ACT perspective, so it is state based for us, territory based. Um, so in our contract with ACT Health, the approach with the service is if if the team, including Mel and David, determine that something has a high risk of lethality, we categorise that as a red drug and we have one hour to notify ACT Health of that finding. That's happened twice. 
um, the um, four um, fluoroamphetamine and M bomb combination, and the um, metanidazine, which was brought in as an oxy pill. Um, from there, ACT Health make a determination with a reference group or stakeholders, and they may choose to do a public alert. They did that on one of the two occasions, and um, uh, we have a colleague in the room who you might be able to speak to afterwards, Ella. Um, she might be able to talk you through that. But um, essentially, it was uh, it seemed really relevant to the full population. It didn't seem relevant just to a, a community group. When it's more relevant to a community group, they encourage us and we take the liberty to release community notifications and that would be also the case for things we categorise as yellow, which might be that instead of it being an upper, it was a downer or it had something else um, risky and interesting in it, but um, that's just the case in the ACT. Kia ora. Oh. Hi, Emily Hughes from the New Zealand Drug Foundation. Um, as someone mentioned before, we have fully legalized drug checking in our country, but part of that is that we have full confidentiality for clients, so it's illegal for us to collect any information about clients. And one thing that I've been talking to other drug checkers about is that there's limitations around checking for minors, which isn't an issue for us, and it's only something that's come up over the last couple conferences. For the checkers there, are you able to test drugs for minors, and how do you get around it if you yeah. are or are not? We, we don't ask people to aid. So we ask their name, but we don't ask for ID just mm. in terms of the waiver, so they could write anything on the waiver, really. But it demonstrates a systematic way that we're informing people about the limitations. But everything else is completely de-identified. Mm -hmm. People are asked to provide a code name. So, it, it, yeah, we, they, anyone can come in. If they came in and said they're 14, we'd say, great, we're so glad you're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may, um, for example, what we do, we uh, elaborate a code with the first letter of the name, the first letter of the surname, and the date of birth. Mm -hmm. And that's like our code to keep in track of, uh, of the sample and stuff. If I could add for us here in Canada, uh, our research ethics are based around the age of consent, which in BC is 19. So when our harm reduction worker does sample intake, they go over our consent form. Mm -hmm. uh, the person can self-identify if they're a minor or not. If they are under the age of 19, we'll still go forward with the drug test. Um, that is information for them to have. However, we cannot include that data in our research mm -hmm. um, under like the like uh, ethics of, of it. Um, there are certainly minors who come in or who appear to be quite young who identify as over 19, and that's also great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tracy Green um, from Street Check in the USA. Um, I had a question. I was really struck by the data, Rita, that you shared on the timeline where the coroner um, mm. called for drug checking. And yeah. it made me think of um, all the coroners past who've kind of stood up and said something about the decedents that they were really moved by. Um, that made naloxone possible in some of the states yeah. I've worked. It's made um, uh, opioid treatment therapy in the prison possible, um, places that were obvious intervention points. I was curious, um, in the case of like two, two different uh, stories in, in so far in Australia, but um, did you have, um, perhaps on the can test side, um, did you have um, some unexpected help along the way? Um, and is there a role for coroners or other um, medical professionals beyond the medical toxicologists um, who might be able to help along the way to um, stand up and help um, advocate for not forensic testing, not clinical diagnostic testing, but drug checking? In the ACT, we haven't had a coronial in recent years that ha highlighted on deaths from um, overdoses. Um, we, they tend to focus on the failure of services when they have occurred rather than on mm. drug checking. Um, but New South Wales and Victoria coroners have been very vocal and coroners elsewhere as well about the need for drug checking, particularly when they um, do a, a coronial inquiry on a number of young people who have died tragically. So, yeah. 
I might add to that. So that 20, 2021 report in Victoria, I think, was the first time we saw the coroner getting on board and going, nah, the drug needs to be drug checking. And that was for the, all five reports that came out at the same time. But in 2019, um, the New South Wales coroner had come out and recommended very similarly because there'd been a spate of festival attendee deaths and a huge increase compared to the national average. Um, and then that overdose report came out. So. I'm not going to speak on behalf of the coroner's office, but I might um, lean towards they kind of like putting their, their boot in when they can see it's things not going well. So there's absolutely a role for the coroner here, and I think they have got things over the line in other contexts. Um, we also, I think, in Victoria are very lucky because we've got people working within the coroner's office who really do have a sort of drug and alcohol or a, a drug harm reduction agenda. So when you've got the good people on the inside, it helps a lot. I think, um, so earlier today as well, David in his session outlined some of the other factors in the journey of kind of winning people over or discovering that we're on the same page in advocating yes. for this. So I think Canberra is unique in Australia in that there was a lot of people on board with drug checking before it came through, but um, winning over people like the Chief Health Officer and um, working with police and removing some of those potential barriers through relationships, particularly in a smaller jurisdiction, it's, it can be somewhat easier to get your hooks in than it might be in a bigger state as well. Mm. Okay, if I ask a question. Um, Phoenix, student, uh, user. Um, yeah. My question is about uh, collaboration, data sources, um, you know, where that's coming from and sort of acknowledging sort of what's happening in users' spaces and their communities, uh, particularly when it comes to drug testing. Um, I'd like to thank Peeps in Canada because uh, sort of under the radar, you're actually doing a lot of Australia's drug checking for us um, from Western Australia, Northern Territory, South Australia, Victoria. Um, there's actually a lot of reports going out uh, which aren't reported by government, they aren't reported by any organisations, they're reported by users. We're detecting fentanyl and we're making our own reports and we're getting it out there and no one's talking about it and you're paying 100 bucks for each mm. test for us to do that privilege. And not just that, grassroots, we are paying users to go and actually send it over there as well. Um, and I think, I don't know, my question is like, how do we actually support one another? You know, rather than trying to hide this substance came from Sydney or Western Australia, you know, if Victoria is looking for data, can we go to Canada and say, hey, how many samples did you actually get from Victoria? Um, what were those samples actually present? You know, what other reports are coming out? How do we share that information? How, what, what do users actually find useful in a, a drug report? Anyway. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> The difficulties in data exchange are so prevalent, and I find it uh, frustrating how you know isolated we all are in our ability to communicate. Uh, I think about xylazine. Um, there was like a paper put out in 2016 or something about xylazine um, in like Philadelphia that just got swept under the radar and then all of a sudden in May of this past year we see a huge spike of it and we we're like what's going on you know we're digging back through the literature but like had had the infrastructure been in place for us to share that information from the start I feel like it wouldn't have been a surprise um, you know the the results that we get from people who use drugs inform our methodology so much. So like when I when I look at the can test reports and I see like th this adulterated ketamine, that's like, okay, well, what it, what's going on there? Because for us in BC, ketamine's just ketamine. Mm -hmm. But had I, you know, had, you know, had we known that there's these other things floating around and like the, the ability to link the results of you know, two floral, two oxo, PCE, to an experience, mm. as opposed to just saying this is, you know, whatever this compound is, like, knowing how to link those experiences to the data that we collect, it just improves our lot. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm not really answering the how, but I know, I recognize that it needs to occur, um, because the, the knowledge that we all hold um, is just so complementary. 
There's a wonderful project underway um, by people who've been at the conference, um, the Prompt Response Network's The No here in Australia, and that will, um, my understanding is that will enable um, people to post user experiences and notifications that will be mediated and shared across Australia. Maybe they need to level up and go international. <laughs> that yeah. would be cool. <laughs> okay. Um, we are in time, but I'm definitely sure that our incredible panelists are more willing to keep this conversation outside this room. Uh, so again, thank you all so much, and thank you all also to be here. And yeah, we'll see you outside.